I want to welcome you to the third of four IO Psychology Workshop Series presentation. The topic today is on professionalism in the workplace. The next and final part of the series will take place on Monday, April 27th at 1 o'clock p.m. on resume preparation and cover letter writing. Now I'd like to briefly introduce your speaker, Dr. Elliot D. Lassen. Dr. Lassen is Professor of the Practice and Graduate Program Director of our Masters of I.O. program with decades of experience in I.O. and human capital. During that time, he has worked in the private, public, consulting, nonprofit, and higher education sectors. Dr. Lassen has expertise in careers and job search and has been a sought after resource nationally about employment and workplace topics. He's been featured in recent media appearances on Maryland Public Television, WBAL Radio, and Fox 45 Baltimore. His articles have appeared in the Baltimore Business Journal, Yahoo, Finance, and Huffington Post. Dr. Lassen earned his BA in psychology from UMBC. He then went on for his MA and PhD in organizational psychology from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Dr. Lassen holds certification as a senior human resources professional from the HR Certification Institute and SCP from SHRM. In 2009, Dr. Lassen was appointed by Governor O'Malley to the Governor's Workforce Investment Board, where he served for five years. Dr. Lassen has mentored many students in their careers, facilitating internships and job opportunities. Students consistently reach out to Dr. Lassen years after graduation to ask for career development guidance or really to check in. We hope that you enjoy the presentation. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the session over to Dr. Lassen. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, so, so what I'd like to um, kind of start off with are a couple of a couple of questions, and uh, maybe to make it a little bit more interactive, you know what? I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Let me pose the first question. And what is the workplace? We're on April 20th, 2020, when this is being recorded. So, how would you define the workplace? If anybody could uh, maybe chime in, unmute, unmute yourself, and then mute yourself. What 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 do we mean by the workplace? Is it a physical space? Is it a virtual space? Yeah, that's what I'm uh, struggling with. I think it's more just like the time where you are performing your work or your job duties that when you take on that character where you perform the duties for eight hours or so, that's where the workplace, regardless of the physical location. Okay, so that's a very important point because what you just did was encapsulated it in time uh, and we could talk about nine to five as being the traditional work day so we can think about eight hours taking place from uh, nine to five eight thirty to five if you want to include a half hour lunch break but in today's reality even before COVID, even before COVID-19 I would say that the concept of nine to five is somewhat um, is somewhat dated because even before Zoom meetings and WebEx, which is what we're using today, uh, I don't believe that people's jobs were encapsulated, were confined within the parameters of the traditional eight hour workday. And for, furthermore, I would just add, even if we were to talk about the eight hour workday from nine to five, we know that people have a preparation period from the time that they wake up in the morning they are preparing for work, they are getting dressed, they are grooming, they're eating. And also on the back end, there is a whole decompression phase. After you've put in your hours, your time, let's say 5, 5.30, you're going home. So there's a lot of baggage, a lot of, a lot of psychological baggage, a lot of practical baggage, meaning things that are uh, un, uh, uncompleted, incomplete, uh, that, you need to, that you need to attend to, that you're thinking about that carry over to the next day, people checking their, uh, they're checking their emails after hours. So I think that we can think about maybe eight hours, at least on average, uh, that we spend quote unquote on the clock. But I think that there are some variances, there are some variances there. Uh, one thing I wanted to just point out, and that is the, the obvious elephant in the room right now, is that we are, for the most part, working remotely, 
Okay, so occasionally I'll see my uh, the the, uh, the postal service uh, deliverer uh, come to my house. So he's not working remotely. Uh, some people that are working in supermarkets are not working remotely, but we have things like Instacart where uh, in the gig economy, people are uh, for extra money or because they've been furloughed or laid off, they're, 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 they're working these gigs of doing Instacart pickups and deliveries, meaning they're going through supermarkets and picking up people's groceries and then they are delivering it to people's homes. So where is that person's workplace? Is that person's workplace in his or her car? Is it in is it in the um, is it in the supermarket? Who is his or her employer? You know, is it a 1099 situation or is it a W-2? I don't know how the Instacart people work. I imagine it's probably a 1099 type of situation. But I think our concept of of, of workplace has changed over the years, and I I think it's important to emphasize the phrase over the years because there are still people that are in the workplace right now who are uh, holdovers from previous eras. And I'm not going to get into the whole discussion of different generations in the workplace. Uh, suffice it to say there are different generations uh, in the workplace, some of whom have a more traditional uh, definition of workplace in terms of both both space, location, context, and time. And, and, and that's a point that I'm going to uh, reemphasize later on as we talk about different styles in the workplace. The second question you see up on the screen is what is professionalism? And that, of course, is going to be the theme of what we're discussing here today. Uh, and that, I think, is also uh, moderated the definition of professionalism is, is moderated sometimes based on the type of job that one has, as well as the generational cohort in which one has been informed. The last question is whether professionalism is important. And I think the resounding answer to that is it has to be yes. Uh, we are all working in what we call professional type of uh, I would say for most of us, we're working in professional types of jobs with professional level job descriptions. Uh, everybody on this call, I would assume, is here because you're in a master's program at UMBC or elsewhere. And the answer to the question, of course, is yes, but the, but the, the application of that yes is really going to differ based on different uh, based on different factors. So once again, professionalism is important, but how do we how do we understand professionalism? The question is why. One question at least is why, because there's a, uh, a phrase that we use. I think I may have used it last week in the uh, discussion um, related to uh, interview preparation. Uh, there is a uh, an adage that you don't get a second chance to make for to make a first impression, and we know from social psychology we spend uh, a bit of time talking about the primacy effect. That's really the foundation for that adage. The primacy effect that the first exposure that one has to an individual is going to make a lasting impression, and people who have ongoing relationships with that individual are always going to be influenced by that initial impression. Uh, and if one comes across as the opposite of professional, meaning unprofessional, and we'll try to set some boundaries as to what that means, uh, then it's very difficult for the recipient of that first impression to, to discount that, uh, you know, to discount that first impression because that's just the imprint that has been uh, that has been made. There's another phrase that people have uh, talked about uh, in recent times. It's one of those things that you would probably see as a meme on LinkedIn or elsewhere that employers don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think especially in today's times where one's emotional well-being one's psychological state is, has become so relevant 
because of the anxiety, because of the concern that people have uh, about life, about their jobs, really about everything that's going on, that uh, employers, employees, if you are a supervisor, they don't care how much you know, how much of an expert you are, because sometimes the expertise is going to be irrelevant. But if I'm an employee and I have a supervisor, I want to see that my supervisor is empathetic, is caring. Okay, so really the word care is, is very important uh, as well. Uh, and even in more quote unquote normal times, uh, the employer is going to be concerned about the level of effort that is put in, the seriousness, seriousness which, with which one takes his or her job, the, um, the, the respect that he or she has for the organization and its values. That is going to be perhaps even more important than how well you did on your uh, SATs or you know, what your GPA was in graduate school. So I think obviously a person has to have a certain amount of technical skills and knowledge, but knowing how much you respect the workplace, you respect the work that you do and the organization and its values is, is also uh, really uh, paramount. I mentioned the idea of a first impression, and that first impression is not necessarily confined to that particular job that you have just obtained, because what happens when it's time to move on and you would like a recommendation or a reference for the next, for the next employer? Or let's say if one's reputation has been tainted in some way through one's social media presence and contributions and posts and the like on various, uh, on various uh, channels. In addition, uh, the world has become a smaller place. And while you might think that the recommendation process for a future job is a formal process, already a relationship between your current, uh, perhaps potential future employer, they may have a, an extracurricular relationship where they'll text uh, and kind of keep things over the, under the radar and may, uh, there may be some information that uh, would be of a non-positive nature, shall I say, that could be communicated under the radar of whatever the formal process for references are. And as I mentioned before, professionalism is important and it's not just for millennials. A lot of times millennials get a bad rap because their definition of professionalism deviates from what has previously been the case. But when we think about Generation X or baby boomers, uh, I've personally, uh, I have observed unprofessional behavior, uh, regardless of generational cohort, it just manifests itself a little bit differently in each of the cohorts. So what I like to do is kind of look at, you know, infuse a little bit of psychology uh, into this discussion because we are we all are among uh, IO psychologists and differentiate between we can talk about attributes or, or or maybe even traits or attitudes and then the next slide we'll talk about professionalism behaviors and we all know that there is a correlation between attitudes and behaviors there is a correlation between traits and behaviors but if we think about what is, a little, what is thought to be a little bit more internal, the attributes, I would like to kind of explore them first. And I have a list here. I, I'm not going to go through all of them because I'm sure most of you are familiar with what I'm talking about and what their definitions might be. But let me just point out a, point, point out a few. Gratitude. So gratitude is something that we... Uh, have been talking about in recent times uh, in the general world where we have to have a certain gratitude for um, our safety. We have gratitude for our health. We have gratitude for our family's health. We have gratitude because we have a job in, in, in some cases. Like we can't take that for granted. Uh, so that's why we have to have a gratitude. And when, when one is in the workplace, whether it's under COVID-19 circumstances or 
generally speaking, uh, gratitude about the opportunity that one has been given after one has been hired into a job, into an organization, that is a mindset that really needs to come through. And really it should start coming through from the very beginning. Gratitude about being offered the job, gratitude about being able to work in a, uh, in a space that is comfortable, where there is collegiality. So there's a lot to be said about gratitude. The fourth bullet, recognition, recognition of the existence of others. Those of you who are familiar with emotional intelligence know that that is a really a very big part of when we talk about uh, emotional intelligence, EI, if you will. And that is understanding that I am not working in a vacuum. Even if I have a job that is for the most part autonomous, but in all cases, I am working with someone. I'm working as a direct report underneath someone. I am supervising someone who is a direct report. And the understanding that one does not work alone is part of professionalism. And that will, as we'll see in the next uh, slide after this, uh, that will be manifested in one's behavior towards, towards others. The other, uh, f the other attributes that you can see, uh, self-ownership, and that is owning up to one's mistakes at times, uh, maybe taking legitimate credit for accomplishments. That's also part of, uh, part of professionalism. And the final one is knowing your job role, knowing where your lane ends and where the other individual's lane begins. Uh, knowing, where, knowing your place in the organization, knowing your place sometimes in the politics and power dynamics of the organization. So these are all professionalism attributes. Now we can't necessarily teach somebody, uh, you know, the professionalism attributes. Sometimes these are things that are part of somebody's upbringing or development or nurturing. However, what we can do is we can, we can point out through feedback, maybe 360 degree feedback, how people see them, uh, we can point out behaviors. And that gets into the next slide. One of the things that we discussed last week in presenting yourself for a job interview is how do you come across? How do you come across with your dress? How do you come across in terms of your verbal, uh, the way you answer the questions, your nonverbal, your posture, your hand gestures, uh, so your self-presentation, how do you show up to work every day? And, you know, we kind of uh, think about, in we, we think about in 2020, how we're showing up to work every day while we're sitting in front of a laptop with a webcam, and uh, maybe some of us are wearing pants, some of us are not wearing pants, uh, but Regardless, we'll see that there probably are going to be some industry standards of how one presents him or herself, uh, even in front of a webcam. Another behavior uh, relates really to uh, any type of communication. Now, I, I'm looking here at my desk. I have a, a landline. I have a cell phone to my left. I have um, a an iPad also to my left where I have a laptop in front of me. Uh, I'm using those as communication tools. I'm using those to send emails. I'm using those to post things on LinkedIn. I'm using those as communication channels. And how do we come across in a text? How do we come across when we post on social media? Um, are we posting uh, things that are off, you know, a little risque or off color um, or perhaps uh, harassing in nature or offensive in nature or aggressive in nature. That's also part of communication in 2020. What happens if one gets into some sort of um, dispute about an idea about some about something that relates to a policy that one does not like, or if there is uh, a different approach to solving a problem 
the supervisor is advocating one approach. The direct report wants to use a different approach. So there's a certain amount of tension and conflict that exists. Now, how is that, how is that conflict going to be resolved? Is there going to be some sort of deference to precedent in the organization? Is the person going to defer to the, to the supervisor because of that chain of authority? I had, I've had situations uh, as a supervisor when um, someone who was under my uh, supervision, uh, he did not take that guidance well. And uh, as it turns out, he, he, he did not do well in the organization and he didn't, la he didn't last that long. Uh, unfortunately, he had a certain amount of skill set that we really very much admired and we would have liked to retain him, but his manner of solving problems and his manner of resolving conflict, he didn't have the intelligence, the emotional intelligence to, uh, to do that in a professional way. And unfortunately, I, I, I think that that was part of a deeper attitude in how uh, he got along with others and, and unfortunately, after that, uh, I heard that he did not really meet with great professional success. So we have the attributes, which are the attitudes or the traits, if you will, and then we have the professionalism behaviors. These professionalism behaviors obviously are what can be readily observed by supervisor, by coworkers, clients. You know, we talk about, I'm, I'm focusing on the hierarchy of the organization, you have a supervisor and direct report, but uh, whether it's uh, customers or clients. You know, let's say if you're working in retail, if somebody is working at a Wegmans or uh, a Walmart, uh, the behavior with which the person uh, providing that customer service uh, services those customers, that is also going to come across. And if there's a, any sort of negative uh, behaviors, then that might very well be reported to a supervisor and pointed out um, to the to the employee. Getting a little bit more specific in terms of professionalism behaviors, uh, we had on the previous slide the idea of self presentation. We're going to get into. Um, uh, this morning, if you can mute yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, we can, we can get into what is considered to be professional appearance, professional uh, professional dress. Uh, there are going to be norms, uh, and sometimes those norms are communicated in a formal dress code. There might be some differing dress codes depending on the day of the week or depending on whether there's going to be a client-facing interaction, uh, but that is a specific uh, way of manifesting self-presentation, and that appearance can also include grooming uh, in addition to one's into one in addition to one's clothing Punctu punctuality and reliability uh, that that was going to be part of the uh, one of the clips i was going to show uh didn't didn't make it unfortunately into what we were able to record but certainly the link is there uh does someone show up consistently on time or does somebody show up consistently late and in, in IO psychology we talk about reliability and consistency is a uh, synonym for uh, for reliability and 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 uh, and vice versa. How does one how does one roll into work? Uh, once again, there might be some differing differing norms. Let's say if somebody pulled an all nighter uh, the night before and everybody knows it, it might be okay for somebody to roll in. And when I say to roll in, it doesn't necessarily mean to get to the workplace, the physical location, but the way we're dealing. With is when somebody starts to respond to emails or when somebody gets on her or his uh, Zoom call, first Zoom call in the morning. How does one's workspace look? If a person has a cubicle, is it always uh, messy? Is it, uh, is it organized? Once again, that's going to send a message to coworkers, to customers, clients, and supervisors about who you are. Now, it might fair to define one productivity simply and solely on the basis of one's workspace, but it does 
it does send a message. And I would just say that the guideline should be that it should be reasonable. It doesn't have to be absolutely impeccable. If you still have your coffee mug and spoon from the morning coffee on your desk, it's not something that is going to necessarily be an eyesore. But if you have a coffee mugs from the past week lined up uh, without being cleaned uh, and the spoons are still sitting in there and they may smell, uh, then that would not be uh, appropriate. One's virtual presence, really, that is what we're, what we're doing right now. I am conveying a virtual presence. We're doing this webinar that is recorded. Uh, we have a virtual presence by way of what we put into the chat. We, um, uh, we, we have uh, ways that we post uh, information on, on social media. That's also part of our virtual presence. So that is another part of one's um, presentation, one's self-presentation. And I would say, what would your boss or coworker see or hear when passing your cubicle? Would they see Facebook up on the screen? Would they see Twitter up on the screen? Would they see you working in a spreadsheet that is part of the uh, task of the day? Is it possible that somebody could be on Facebook during lunch? Yeah, that might be acceptable. But if we take kind of some random sampling of time during the day and every time you're passed by someone, they see you doing something that's not part of your job responsibilities, then that may start to send a message. It may start to send a message to your boss. It may start to send a message to coworkers. So kind of that's the, the, the that question. Uh, should be something that everybody should think about. What would people think as they pass your cubicle on a daily basis? When we communicate, uh, we can talk about nonverbal communication, uh, but for the most part, uh, we can channel this slide to deal with verbal communication. Okay. Let's say you walk into an office and you meet somebody for the first time you meet a client for the first time, or you meet the receptionist who is going to escort you into that client for an important meeting. So I think that we kind of have to revert to uh, manners as they have been uh, taught to us from a very young age, uh, you know, saying things like please and thank you, Graciousness, if the receptionist, for example, offers you a uh, bottle of water prior to your meeting or prior to your job interview, uh, to be cordial and, and, and gracious and, and express gratitude. Oh, that would be great. Thank you very much. It's very hot outside. I had a long drive to get here. Um, so that's very much appreciated. That cold water really hit the spot. And uh, when we communicate with others, uh, we should not be over the top because over the top sometimes appears gratuitous that we're kind of putting on a show. Um, so that should, you shouldn't be overly effusive in, to an extreme. Also, we also have to think about if we're coming across as being overly assertive, maybe bordering on aggressive, okay? Uh, we can kind of think of examples, uh, examples of that, whether it's in a customer service situation that you're not pleased with something, uh, or you're trying to force a point uh, to a group, let's say in a focus group, you're, you're forcing your, your hand on, on others uh, to try to get your point of view across. Uh, you should be cognizant of, uh, when I say you, we all should be cognizant of how we come across in that type of communication. Another decision that we make when we reach out, when we need to communicate with people. And it's true today, I think it was, it was true leading, leading up to this, uh, and that is what is the best way to communicate with a coworker? And I'm sure we're all victim to this where we could be sitting in uh, an adjacent cubicle or the next office over and we send a text we send an email. Now, in some cases, whether, let's say, there are attachments or, uh, you know, something really quick, um, it may not make sense to actually get up and, 
uh, stand up and go the, the two feet to the other person's cubicle or go the five feet to the other person's office. I certainly, I certainly get that. But what happens sometimes is that people will use the technology as a crutch so that they don't have to have that in-person interaction in real time. And I think that's a, that's a problem. And, and, and maybe that is also a function of people being digitally native uh, in the uh, more contemporary generations, digitally, digitally native, meaning that they grew up with the technology, they grew up texting, uh, and they're used to it, as opposed to people who are more quote unquote old school. I think that there has to be some sort of balance here. Uh, I remember hearing from a colleague uh, years ago, probably 10 years ago now, that if there's a back and forth on email that's going more than like three times, then it's time to pick up the phone or it's time to go to that person's cubicle. Because when we talk in real time, when we speak, and we can use voice inflections. Yes, I know that there are emojis to convey that we're kidding or it's a joke, but you really lose some things in the communication when you are not speaking, when you don't have that combination of eye contact. Uh, you can simulate some of that using Zoom which or, or, or Skype where you have that um, real time uh, audio visual, but it's not perfect. Sometimes the technology is, is not uh, perfect and sometimes you lose some of that, but it's, it's better than something that's totally, that's totally uh, digital. Uh, and when we, when we talk over the phone, I think that there's a certain phone etiquette. I'm not going to get into it uh, in great depth, but uh, see, there's a question. Hold on a second. Um, I'm not going to get into a great, in, in, into it in great depth, other than saying that I think that a lot of people have lost the art of communicating by phone. I've had situations where somebody calls me and they ask me a question in a previous job. Uh, they ask me a question and they don't even introduce themselves by name. They just jump in and ask the question. And that's not really appropriate because uh, you kind of need a soft, uh, you kind of need a, uh, a soft opening. Okay. There was a question. Um, how about whoever raised their hand, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Somebody raised their hello, hand. This is, hello, this is Melissa White. Hi. Hi. I was just going to speak to your last point. Um, with my current job, we have a lot of, sometimes there's, like you said, miscommunication after three emails and people start to get really frustrated. And I've learned that if you just at that time pick up the phone, it solves a lot more problems than you would think. Same thing with um, when things are getting tense, like near a deadline, people email um, and they get kind of aggressive, uh, I think, quicker. So if you jump on a WebEx and you can see, especially if you turn your camera on and everyone can see each other or even just hearing the voice, like it, it resolves a lot of things and, and can calm people down. Thank you. Um, speaking to that point, there is a concept that I read about uh, that was uh, put out there by a psychologist uh, by the name of John Suler, S-U-L-E-R, and he referred to it as the online disinhibition effect. So, kind of sounds like a mouthful. The online disinhibition effect. And essentially what that is is as follows. That is, uh, and, and I think he was really addressing some things that we see with uh, cyberbullying, but I think we can apply it more generally as well. And that is when we hide behind a text or an email or something that's anonymous, let's say on Facebook, um, then before, you know, usually before we say something, we have certain inhibitions. Am I going to speak up at a meeting? Am I going to challenge somebody's idea? Okay, there's a certain conscious accountability that is going to go through one's mind. But if I post something nasty, let's say, you know, cyberbullying type of incident, not that I would, of course, but um, if I post something um, that, especially if it's anonymous and there is this um, kind of de-individuation and hiding behind uh, the technology, I might be more prone to kind of be a little bit more aggressive or a lot more aggressive than if I was facing that person 
in a room in real time. And I think that's really, uh, that's really part of this last bullet point of self-ownership, that when one is in a virtual relationship, a virtual communication channel, email, texting, um, we can soften it with emojis, if you will, uh, or even in, in an email, you can try to soften it. But I think people are more likely to click that button to send because it doesn't come across as real as if I'm actually saying it to the person's face. So I think that that is something uh, that's really something to think about, especially for those who are digitally native, uh, to pick up the phone, as you just said, or to go, go over to the person's cubicle, maybe even apologize if something was interpreted or could have been interpreted in a certain way. Uh, but uh, it's very, I, it's very disheartening when I see that, especially celebrities where they have a lot of followers on Twitter. Uh, this person, oh, he took to Twitter to apologize to that person, okay, instead of actually apologizing the next time that he saw that person face to face. I think it's a bit of a cop out, if you will, and it doesn't really show that self ownership. So thank you for making that point. So our reputation. Uh, we talked about first impressions. Uh, our reputation will, will, will start and will continue through our work product. And if I'm sending an email uh, with interest about a job, with a resume and a cover letter, and there's spelling errors on the resume, or in the email where I'm reaching out to the person, so it's not necessarily just you know, written work, that's why I have it in quotes, uh, but what happens if my sentences are not grammatically correct? Um, so uh, when we work on a job and we are putting together a memo or we're putting together a report, a formal report about something, about a project, a project report, what words do we use? Do we use a lot of contractions like doesn't or uh, won't? Now, with in technical writing, I could tell you, and especially in our program, we do quite a bit of uh, technical writing, as many uh, programs do in I.O. Uh, we generally think about APA style that kind of, uh, you know, does not look positively at a lot of uh, casual language or contractions, even if we would use that in conversation. But there's a certain professional style. Once again, I can't get into the specifics now, but you probably uh, you probably are aware of that. And even if you're not writing a report, I think you should err on the side of more formality when you are writing official communication like reports or emails um, you know, to, to um, uh, let's say, start an email uh, with the person's correct title. You know, so if, if somebody is, uh, is, is, Do is Dr. Jones and then you put uh, either just the first name or you put Mr. Jones, then that is going to convey to that recipient, to Dr. Jones, it's going to convey that you didn't pay attention to what his job title is or what his you know, educational title is. Uh, so that is uh, also something uh, to, keep, uh, to keep in mind. Um, certainly things like formatting, making sure that uh, fonts are consistent throughout the documents, uh, other aspects of formatting, uh, and also the style of writing should, of course, be consistent with the uh, context in which it's being written. Okay. Um, I would venture to say that many of us, many of us have at least two email addresses, at least two email accounts. Maybe we have one that is our school email account. Maybe we'll have a, a personal email account. Maybe we'll have a work email account. Uh, and emails, the communication, the language that's used should really be consistent with uh, the email address uh, or the context in which it's being, it's being sent. Uh, what is your email address? Uh, so let's say you're applying for a job and it would be inappropriate for you to use an email address of your current employer when you're, when you're applying for a job uh, with a different employer. It would be inappropriate uh, you know, to use your current email address. Uh, you decide to go with your personal email address. 
So if your personal email address is something that's a little bit casual, um, you know, like uh, party, uh, party animal 25, okay? If I am the recipient of a resume from party animal 25, before I even look at the person's resume, I might say, wow, uh, this person, uh, let's maybe I should check out the person's uh, social media to see whether this person is a good fit for our organization, even before I look at the, uh, the resume itself. So pay attention to your email address. It should be relatively neutral, maybe first name, dot last name at Gmail or something that is reasonable, maybe with a couple of numbers in there. Um, what some people do is if there's kind of a back and forth communication, uh, then uh, I would say to start a new subject line if the theme of the correspondence has in fact, uh, has in fact changed. We have various tools and emails. Uh, we have uh, for sending, a, if you're sending a message, you could use something called BCC, which means that nobody else knows who the other recipients are. And that can be somewhat effective when you want to somehow separate the recipients of that communication, right? So uh, for if you want somebody to just see what you wrote, but you don't want the other people to know uh, who that person that was viewing it was, so that would, that, that would be another reason to do, uh, to do uh, BCC. Um, I think the next bullet point of saying thank you, that really just uh, refers to general, um, general uh, etiquette. Uh, your signature in your email, most people will include some sort of signature. It could be if you're a student, it will have graduate student uh, UMBC at the very, at the very bottom. Uh, a lot of people will put their uh, phone number or cell number. Um, what, 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 what a person really shouldn't do, I know that some people will put like a quote from something that's profound, but uh, I would keep it somewhat neutral in terms of if you decide to put that as part of your signature, because unwittingly, uh, everybody that you send an email to is going to see that. Um, you know, it shouldn't be necessary. It shouldn't be something that has like religious overtones because that could be seen as uh, somewhat offensive to those people that you know don't subscribe to that uh, to the belief system. And uh, just realize that when you commit something to email, uh, that is something that can and will be forwarded. So if you have something that is uh, questionable as to whether you want forwarded, that might be a reason to pick up the phone. And you should also scroll down before you send the email. There might be something from a previous correspondence that you're forwarding that you did not intend, that you don't want the next recipient to see. So just be cognizant of that. Um, you, you, you may wanna proofread. A lot of times when people do a copy and paste, there'll be some words in there, some pronouns that don't really make sense anymore. Please make sure that, especially if it's a high stakes email, to proofread a couple of times. Uh, maybe sometimes even send it to your supervisor and say, This is what I'm sending to a customer. Do you think that this is appropriate? Okay. Um, some people will, you know, see something funny. I get these, you know, jokes every so often. And uh, I could tell you that half of the time I've already seen them already because everybody thinks that they want to be the first one to send a particular. A uh, particular joke, okay? And uh, you know, sometimes we get things say urgent, or um, you know, sometimes it's a hoax. We also always have to verify certain things and before we uh, before we send them. I mentioned this before. Um, I'm going to uh, just kind of whiz through this and say that um, you know, when we talk on the phone. Um, especially given the fact that we have uh, smartphones and, and mobile phones that most of us use and carry with us all the time, uh, you should be aware when you pick up the phone of your surroundings. Um, if you're, you know, if you're, if, if you're out and about with a, a lot of noise, you may not want to answer a business call if you're in a bar with a lot of background noise, or if you're in a bathroom or something like that, you don't want to take a call necessarily at that time uh, either. And um, be prepared to leave a message, leave a voicemail message. I know that a lot of people are reluctant to do that. Uh, sometimes we're reluctant to do it because we know that the person never picks up their uh, voicemail messages, which is a problem. I feel that people should, if they have a voicemail box, that they should be checking them. 
uh, and uh, you know, responding and, and addressing them on a regular and consistent basis. Also, um, with caller ID, I can tell you that in, sometimes in, previous, uh, in a previous job, I had people that would refuse to leave a message and they would just keep calling and calling and calling until I would actually pick up the phone. And it's very disconcerting if I have a landline, for example, that I can't really turn off uh, and someone is calling and calling and then I go back to the caller ID and I saw that they, they called five times in the past 10 minutes and did not leave a message. Well, if I'm trying to have a private meeting is constantly ringing from the same person over and over again. When I do call, you better believe that I'm going to address it with that individual that it was in fact inappropriate. Okay. Um, texting. This is uh, gets into a little bit of a, um, a sensitive a sensitive topic because everybody uh, has um, you know, cell phones that they're using for um, that they're using for um, uh, for, for communication. And certainly, if you're in a meeting, uh, it's it's not really good for them to be texting uh, other people because it shows a lack of attention. Uh, so it shows a lack of attention to um, what is being discussed and the people in the the people in the room. Also, uh, to whom do you give out your cell phone number? Do you give out your cell phone number to your boss or to your uh, direct reports? That's a touchy, sensitive question because once that happens, the idea of boundaries, um, you know, the boundaries disappears. Now, I know that a lot of, for a lot of people, they don't have a landline, um, but I just wanted to put it out there. This is something that has changed over the years in terms of acceptability, but it does create a certain uh, a certain familiarity uh, with the person that kind of goes beyond some boundaries. Um, so if you see that somebody texted you, uh, your your supervisor texted you at two o'clock in the morning, do you feel pressured to uh, to respond right away? Well, they had your they had your cell phone number that they could text to, uh, but it's really after hours. You know, so some of those boundaries, you know, really, I think need to be, we need to kind of go back to, to what those boundaries are and having a conversation with the supervisor as to what is going to be the acceptable uh, times. Obviously, if it's an emergency, that's one thing, but what will be the acceptable times to either send or to respond to a, um, to respond to a, uh, a, a text. Um, and also, in terms of, um, you know, when to uh, when to text if you're seen texting at work, um, then that can be a that can be a problem because it shows your lack of engagement. So I talked about that uh, at meetings as well. Okay, mobile devices. Um, I don't think we, get, we have to get into this at great uh, in great depth. Uh, notebooks, laptops uh, that we use. Um, it, many people will bring laptops to meetings, and I think that that's fine, uh, but you want to make sure that whatever you're doing on the laptop is going to be uh, related to that meeting, um, because other people that are at the meeting are going to see what's on your screen and may, in fact, um, take offense that you, they have to pay attention, but somehow you're not, uh, you're not paying attention. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a, uh, just talk about the last points uh, the, uh, below um, at the bottom here. Uh, and, and once again, I think it really gets into this idea of boundary setting. Uh, if somebody is off the clock, they could, it could be after hours at two in the morning, uh, or it could be uh, while somebody's on vacation, somebody's on their honeymoon. And I think a lot of people, when they go on vacation, they still take their phones and devices with them. And how disciplined are they going to be? Or, and I think we can all be honest with ourselves. Uh, when we are off the clock, when we're on vacation, uh, and we're not being, you know, we're entitled to vacation, we were in that, uh, are we entitled to actually not check anything and be totally off the grid? Uh, I think that we are entitled to, to, to some of that private time. Uh, but that's, once again, I think that needs to be a conversation around boundaries uh, that needs to take place. 
our new normal, and, and, and I, I, I added the slide uh, because I feel that in April uh, of 2020, where we find ourselves right now, uh, we do have a new normal in terms of the context in which we work. Zoom and WebEx have become the norm. I'm, I don't know if you've read about it, but I've read of the phenomenon of Zoom bombing, where you know, unfortunately people will hack into a Zoom session and wreak havoc and post some things uh, while the conversation is going on. But um, you know, not not focusing on that, uh, we have a new reality where, well, for example, I'm giving a webinar because of obvious reasons. I'm giving a webinar through WebEx, um, and that's a tool that obviously I have to know how to use. We're still on the uh, chat, you know, that I should maybe go to a, a screen share rather than the whole screen. All right, maybe I'll do that next time. Um, I'm just happy that the slides are progressing uh, in the way that I uh, hoped. Uh, so, you know, but that's something that we're still kind of tweaking uh, and and ha there's a learning curve that still uh, needs to be needs to be addressed. Uh, but what is what is the background look like? Uh, I know that on Zoom, I have a background that's kind of cool. It's a, a football stadium. It looks like I'm sitting in the crowd uh, or sitting in front of a football stadium. Um, it's a nice green, uh, lush, uh, background, uh, but you know, I think that for, for for to a large extent, it should be neutral. You shouldn't have kids or other distractions in the background that are making noise. Uh, so that's why I ask everybody to mute themselves until they have a question. Uh, so that's something that we all have to learn how to uh, how to master. And if, of course, uh, you know, talk about uh, the last point here. Uh, pants optional, maybe yes, you know, <laughs> uh, if you only have a clean shirt, but you don't have clean pants, uh, you can't see what's happening below the camera. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's been a lot of joking around uh, about about that. But the truth of the matter is we still have to maintain a certain professional persona, regardless of whether we're communicating in person in real time or using one of these digital media. Okay. Um, I, I, I made a reference to this before, you know, about how do we use the internet at work? Obviously, if it's something that is related to work, even if it's a Google search or maybe looking at things on YouTube or Facebook, they may have some applications and relevance at work. Um, so uh, you should really be careful about what other people might see if they pass, if they pass by um, and be aware of, the, of your policies. Your, work policy might be, well, between 12 and 1, we realize that a lot of people want to take a lunch break, and you're allowed to use the internet for that, uh, for other personal use uh, at that time. Uh, sometimes we, people will use the personal, uh, their, their, uh, their, their desktop at the workspace that's provided by the organization. Other times it's your own laptop. Other times it's your personal device, so an iPad, and the like. Uh, and uh, the truth of the matter is, if you're using the company computer, sometimes even the company server, uh, and they have some suspicions about you're using uh, the internet for private purposes, then it may be, um, you know, maybe tracked. Um, and you know, I have here working remotely, so this is actually an older slide, uh, but uh, it did and still will apply. Hopefully, even in, even when we get back to the old normal. Uh, that people will be able to uh, continue to be able to to work remotely, and sometimes they're they're tying into the uh, the company intranet um, or just uh, being in their own in their own space. And if you're using a company laptop, then anything that you do on that company laptop on work time uh, can and 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 might be tracked. So just be cognizant of of that, even of internet use at work, even if you're able to work remotely. And in fact, some of your privileges, some of, if somebody abuses the privilege, uh, some of those might be revoked and they may have to come to, um, they may have to, come to the office. And, and because there's a certain amount of trust that exists in order to work remotely. Okay, um, just a couple more slides before we're, before we're done. I'm cognizant of the time here. Um, and you know, I'm not going to get too much into this. I'll just uh, suffice it to say that uh, if somebody posts something on social media, uh, the internet does not forget. And for people that are trying to establish a professional reputation or to clean up a reputation 
from a previous time in their life, uh, things that are on Facebook, even from years ago, uh, even if somebody deletes the Facebook account, that might be sitting on some cache somewhere, C-A-C-H-E, cache uh, is what I'm talking about. And even if it's a personal account, uh, invariably when somebody is trying to research you, they may come across that personal account. And if there's anything that is problematic, uh, then it's also going, it's going to, it's going to uh, uh, convey a negative uh, image of oneself. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I just want to finish up these last slides. So one of the things that we talked about earlier on in today's webinar is problem solving and um, you know, and conflict, uh, conflict resolution. And a lot of times uh, we have deadlines that we have to uh, maintain uh, for our deliverables. So how do we overcome certain challenges that we have in getting the work in on time? So some of that is going to be uh, time management, our own time management, uh, and getting the uh, resources, getting access to the resources to allow us to complete it, but also knowing where, knowing who to go to, who's the go-to person for a specific technical issue of how to set up a spreadsheet in a certain uh, in a certain format. So having those positive relationships with those individuals ahead of time uh, to allow you to draw upon those resources, I think, are going to be helpful. Um, conflict resolution. A lot of times, um, and you do something to nip it in the bud. Reactive means that you've already experienced the conflict and how to make it get better or how to make it go away. So those are, you know, we can get into some, you know, some scenarios, we can do that offline if anybody has any questions, but uh, conflict resolution, uh, if somebody does not resolve conflicts in a proper way, then that's going to convey an image of unprofessionalism. Uh, we all make mistakes. Uh, sometimes it's a minor mistake. Sometimes it's a major mistake. Sometimes we were misquoted or we sent something in an email that was misinterpreted. Uh, and if we look at it again, we can maybe appreciate why it was misinterpreted. Um, part of being professional is to express contrition, uh, hopefully in real time, in person, uh, but sometimes it can be done by email as well. Uh, you know, what happens if something is not your fault? Uh, that's kind of an art in kind of, you know, stepping back and, 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 and uh, um, you know, walking back a comment uh, that really was, was, was okay, but if it, wa if it was misinterpreted by somebody who may be overly sensitive, then you don't want to call them out for being overly sensitive. You may want to step back the comment uh, and, you know, take ownership for it because it's not just you know, winning the battle, it's, it's about mastering the war. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's, it's more of a journey you're trying to navigate through. Uh, and you wanna do that in a positive, effective way because ultimately having positive relationships in the workplace is one of the keys to professionalism. Okay, so um, I'd like to kind of end the formal portion of this right now. Let me go into the um, the chat. Okay, so some of that was of a technical nature. We kind of got through the uh, the clips. Um, uh, yes, they're wondering if you can expand on job role awareness and what it means exactly, and how does how does it differ from job crafting and engagement in organizational citizenship citizenship behaviors? Okay, thank you. Good question. Um, okay. So I, I hopefully I, I, I explained that um, back when I, I don't know if the question came up um, before I really got to that point, but I'll just go through it again. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Um, so job role awareness is really just knowing where you stand in the organizational hierarchy. Uh, there's a certain pecking order uh, in the organization, you know, kind of vertical. Uh, there's also a horizontal, uh, you know. Uh, I refer to them as lanes, uh, and uh, there are certain things that uh, you are responsible for, uh, but there are certain things that other people are responsible for. I think that can, um, knowing that can obviate 
uh, many uh, different turf battles that can that can occur. So that's kind of what I what I meant by drop drop role awareness. Um, organizational citizenship behavior um, is kind of going above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, so sometimes, you know, if you um, do things outside of your job description, it's kind of fine that you haven't stepped into somebody else's job dis description. If you decide to do something great, but you did that at the expense of allowing somebody else who has a closer connection to whatever that is, uh, you did that at the expense of that person not being able to express that greatness um, or, or behavior, that's where it can be problematic. Uh, so that's how kind of how it differs from, from OCB. Are there any other questions? I, I would invite anybody who has a question at this time to mute themselves, identify yourself, and ask away. Well, I guess if there are no other questions, uh, we can kind of close the uh, webinar at this time. Um, Maggie, are we, are we good? Good to go. Good to go. Okay, we're good to go. So thank you very much for joining. And as Maggie mentioned, uh, a week from today, which is on April the 27th, we will have our uh, last part of this four-part series. Thank you, stay safe, and have a good day.